All right. Right on. You're not going to ask me any hard questions. I'm going to stump you so bad, it's going to make take away your credibility. <laughs> Good answer. Good reply. Yeah, whoa, I got to watch out up here. We're going to be here a long time. <laughs> I'm going to be the one who ends up looking stupid if I try that. Um, here's what's interesting. When it comes to mortgage lending, right? Like you can always test a theory. You're, you're getting feedback. From feedback, okay. It's echoing. It was can I get, I uh, need a sound guy. Is anybody here a sound guy? Maybe it's too close to your mouth. I'm gonna try something different. No, it's actually like a repeat. What you I heard that, yeah. Back, oh, it's, it's a, an echo. Yeah, repeat echo. Yeah. Is that better, is that better? That was me. That yeah. wasn't the mic. <laughs> Am I s no echoes now? It seems to be fine. Okay, good. perfect. How about me? Pretty good. good. Yeah. Okay. So, when you want to test out if something is actually happening, right? It's nice to have multiple sources that you can test at the same time. Uh, mortgage lending companies. These guys have got an army of nerds that are looking for to red flag any properties that would be a bad investment for large billion dollar hedge funds or just large mortgage lending packages. Never in history has anybody ever red flagged waterfront property even to this day. So if it's about to all go and be completely useless and valueless, why would mortgage companies absolutely be happy to, to mortgage waterfront properties? Well, one of the reasons they can be happy about it is because where I live in Comox, the sea is actually receding. That's because the land is rising faster than the sea is. Mm -hmm. And that is because the glaciers melted. It's called post-glacial rebound. The scientists call it some name that no one would ever understand. Uh, I, I even isotonic rebound or something. But it's, glaci it's glacial rebound from the weight of the glaciers on the mountains. A mile of ice weighs a lot. And, and it actually suppresses the Earth's surface, the crust. And at, when that ice is gone, it takes a long time for it to come back because rock doesn't move so quickly. So th that is... Uh, a fact in anywhere where there's been big glaciers, which is almost all of Canada and much of northern Asia and that stuff. But, but there's also other places like Chesapeake Bay where because New York is rising, Chesapeake Bay is actually falling. The land is falling. So that exaggerates the, the, the actual sea level rise. And that's the places that they're using to say, oh, look yeah. how terrible it is, right? That's why I say hire the Dutch, though, because you can build barricades to keep the sea out. And, and, you, and, it, and you're not going to have to run because it's like two millimeters a year is about what it is. So it's, that's, that's this much per year. So I would, uh, but I still would say um, don't put your house right on the water like right in the water. It's not a good, good idea. The sea is rising in places, but it's, it's nothing to worry about. And, and it, it would be really easy for us to either, like Manhattan, for example, which has fairly steep slope to it, it's worth building there. But also where it has a really slight slope, the water's gonna go back way further, right? And so it's worth doing it there too, if that's what people want to do, or they can move. And but it, it isn't going to wreck the real real estate value of, of waterfront properties. I'd say that the worst thing there is hurricanes. Uh, they used, uh, there's a picture out of Japan from their recent hurricane, where you can see it's really only the first row of houses that were destroyed. Right back, only one house back. They're in pretty good condition still, and when you go back two, three houses, they're fine. So this is the thing about building houses on shifting sand. I, I have a home in Cabo Pulmo in Baja, California, Sura, just north of Los Cabos, about an hour and a bit. And our waterfront owners, it's a good thing they're wealthy. 
because they have had to reinforce and put concrete and build pilings and every imaginable thing to keep their house from being washed into the ocean. But they're building on sand in a hurricane zone. You know, that's... It's, it's, it's not smart to do that. But by and large, like my, our house is on the water in Comox, but it's up about 10 feet from the highest tide on a place that was con cut and filled out, right, right out to the edge of the tide. So it's got four of those concrete blocks as a, as a wall before you get up to our property. And they call it a floodplain in the town hall. So I had to go through a r ridiculous process of, of having all kinds of engineers come and everything like that. There's no possible way this piece of property is ever going to flood for the next thousand years. You know, but, so it's totally exaggerated. Uh, you can look at the uh, shorelines in Florida, even where it's sandy, and they've got pictures going back to 1900 showing that there's absolutely been no real change of any kind. And, and you know, super tides are always blamed on it, but, and they don't necessarily happen. They, they happen when the moon is uh, new, just after, and full, and just after, when the biggest tides come, and then a hurricane comes along with it and they call that sea level rise. So that's my take on it anyways. So you're saying a nuanced data-based approach is better than hysteria? Pretty much. <laughs> um, Just sell your house before it comes. Yeah. <laughs> well, o Obama, the Obama's bought a $50 million mansion in Mar Martha's Vineyard, which is about 19 inches above sea level. Yep. So they're clearly not that concerned about it. I don't know. Uh, with the introduction of the movie in 2006, The Inconvenient Truth, there was sort of an explosion in the collective conscience of, you know, the it, it, it heightened, it was the first incre quite the significant increase in the hysteria in pop culture surrounding, um, you know, the climate change, anthropogenic climate change, man-made driven climate change. Now, now that we have things like ESG goals sort of coming into corporate culture and political culture, environmental, social, governance goals, you're seeing the highest levels of financing begin to indoctrinate. They're indoctrinated in this. They believe this is... Do you think they actually believe this? Truly believe this? It's permeated the culture of the highest levels of politics and corporate financing. For example, I mean, even uh, Bernie Sanders brought attention to this recently. He said there's $21 trillion being managed by only three hedge funds. BlackRock, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. Yeah. That's 95% of S&P 500. And they're bought and they're, they've bought, is it that they just believe this? Or is there some sort of, you know, Profit being made from well, this. The point, the thing to ask is, are they benefiting in, a, in inordinately from believing in this or pretending to believe in it or whatever? But it's very clear from the analysis I have looked at that you can't get the returns from that that you can get from traditional uh, risk-based, etc., financing. But I'm not one to really ask this because I stick m mostly to science. I mean, I know enough about it economics uh, to understand uh, that it's stupid to build all these windmills and solar panels. Um, they, you know, the, the science itself on climate change and all the scientists that are being paid money by the government to give them what they want to know, that's a lot of money. But it is nothing compared to the energy side, the cost it is on that side. It, it, it's a thousand times more of the expense and damage is being cost on the decisions that are being made on the assumption that CO2 is going to cause a disaster somehow. And so we're, we're up to, you know, the, the idea that we can run on wind and solar, this is one way to look at it. You put in the wind and solar, you get rid of the fossil fuels, you got about a third of the time that they work. Right? Solar doesn't work at night or when it's cloudy and wind is intermittent and you can't even predict it more than a few days out. So we have to fill that gap with batteries. Well, they act as if batteries are a source of energy. You know, no, they're not. They have to be charged. 
And then after you've discharged them, you have to charge them again. So when do you charge them? When the wind and solar isn't working? Ah, that doesn't work. You have to charge them when the wind and solar is working. Therefore, you have to build three times as much energy capacity as you would if you had a continuous energy source. <clears throat> and those things aren't cheap. And it's stupid anyways. So stupid. It's hard to believe. And so that, I, my motto on wind and solar is may they rust in place. <laughs> and that, that would be a good thing because then we wouldn't have to spend all the money to te tear them down and take them somewhere. But they probably will have to do that Buried. after they've rusted in place. They're burying the windmill blades because they're made of fiberglass and they can't be recycled. And the, the turbines, the big turbines they're building now are having far more failures than the smaller ones did. And uh, I think it's, I don't know why, but the, the price of lithium just collapsed. And I think it's because some of these projects are not going through. I don't think Biden can find enough projects to spend his $275 trillion on. And, and that, that's because it's being realized what the cost really is. And, and, and how telling is it that this year, last year, 23, was the largest consumption of fossil fuels in the history of the world, just last year. And I thought we were supposed to be reducing them with wind and solar. And look at all the wind and solar that's been put in. And that's making brownouts more likely. So it's a completely, I don't, I don't understand it. That you'd think there was somebody who knew enough about these things that they wouldn't let these things happen. But it's like the politicians have no idea of science. And they think, you know, even da da Daniel uh, Smith in Alberta, she's dedicated to continuing to produce fossil fuels and says as the, as the market goes up, she'll increase the production but we're going to go net zero on CO2, right? And that is a distinct misunderstanding of energetics and physics. Because when you burn the fossil fuels, energy comes out that you can use. In order to put the genie back in the bottle, you have to use energy. It's like with, with hydrogen. There are no hydrogen mines. You have to make the hydrogen. You have to produce it with energy by splitting water or some other means. So if our energy is going to require energy to produce it, you've got to subtract that energy from whatever energy you get back. You know, and it, th these things just don't work. This, this is not e even beginning to understand the concept of the, uh, the, the energy ener energetics. The, the, you have re reactions that produce energy and you have reactions that consume energy. And the ones to try to get CO2 into an underground cavern are consuming energy and lots of it. So net zero is impossible. It's a political slogan. It's not a scientific term. In the same way as I like to say that green is a color. <laughs> and that is all it is. It is not a science word. And they pretend it is green hydrogen, right? It's it's completely loony, and uh, so I think this whole thing's going to fall on its face, and the sooner the better. And it's, it seems like it's a privileged position to have uh, this green philosophy. I mean. As you said before, not only has uh, fossil fuels preserved forests in, in the case of Western Europe, but I mean, how many people in less developed countries would die overnight or in, in, in the first week or month of going net zero around the world? I mean, there are people in, in, in Africa, parts of Asia and South America that rely on fossil fuels for their light, light uh, water uh, filtration systems, uh, the fact that they don't have to burn manure inside their small huts for, for heat, uh, etc. I mean, it's, it's the latte swilling, uh, Tesla driving class, the upper echelon, you know, mostly whites, 
who can afford to go, quote unquote, deeper into the green zone, but it would kill a tremendous number of colored people, which is supposed to be the, you know, one of the, no, the faux pas of that culture. And I mean, we, with uh, Trudeau can get elected with a handful of writings, Ontario, Quebec only which is why the West and the energy industry in the West is just skewered every time. Yep. And we consume just as much, and then you're, like you said, more fossil fuels, even under this green banner, yet we're importing oil from places that refine it dirtier than we do, and bring in, sh and what, what, how much is a tanker, a super tanker taking oil and gas from around the world instead of producing it in Alberta and refining it here, and it's 30,000 gallons an hour, I think it takes to drive these things. So not only are we consuming more, it's costing more to get it here. So it's all, it, the math doesn't add up, it's completely bogus, and you know, the amount, just the electric car system, for the electric car craze, if you, right now, about 1% of North America drives electric vehicles. If we bump that number to 10%, we'd shut our grids down, our current grids down. It's not possible to do. And the actual extraction of the, 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 the there's a thousand pound battery that goes with each electric vehicle that lasts eight to 10 years. The cobalt, the magnesium, the, the, the lithium, that the mining that has to go along to produce these things is all run by fossil fuel equipment. Exactly. Right? And so there's a car, and the grid that it's sucking energy off of is 60% fossil fuels in, in the US. Yep. So again, none of this makes sense. Why is it the only people like, I mean, when it comes to corporate culture, which often make these environmental social goal decisions seemingly against their own best interest, I have to chalk that up to they believe it. It's like a new religion. If you ended fossil fuels like boom and all nitrogen fertilizer, there would be at least four billion dead of the eight billion within a short period of time. And the, the nitrogen fertilizers, it's, it's nice that this has been brought up in political conversation because maybe people will learn more about what it, what it is because people take it for granted because they don't have any nitrogen fertilizer except they're eating food that was made with it. And uh, there were two Nobel Prizes for the uh, process of taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and making it into ammonia. And, and thereby producing nitrogen fertilizer. And uh, <clears throat> Haber, in a lab, invented the procedure. 600 PSI temperatures, incredibly hot, uh, sorry, pressures, incredibly hot temperatures, a very like four-stage process. It's, a, it's so brilliant that he won the Nobel Prize for that in 1910 or somewhere down around there. And then Bosch, which is a name that's known in industry, figured out how to scale it up so we could have millions of tons of, your, of nitrogen fertilizer being produced. And today it is responsible for approximately half of the food we produce. Along with CO2, uh, providing additional fertilizer and making, so, so they're against all the right things. Yeah. And I mean, you could say that in a positive way, but it's not, it's in a negative way. Because they are against the things we should be doing and continuing to do unless we all want to die. Which we're gonna do anyways, but I'd rather not do it like in two months from now. <laughs> if I could help it. <laughs> So it, 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 it's, it's just insane. It really is what they're, what they're suggesting we do. And in, in, I'm, in, I'm glad in a way that they are proposing something so ludicrous and irrational and damaging that maybe more people will wake up to the, to the threat. What do you make of, uh, in a recent Guardian article, Bill Gates said something interesting. It's almost as if he started to soften, soften his stance on the, his hard environmental goals. Uh, he said, quote, there's a lot of climate exaggeration. 
The climate is not the end of the planet, so the planet is going to be fine. We're going to be okay. What do you make of that? I'm not sure. He must have met somebody that talked him into believing it was not so serious. Uh, he's been one of the main people on this. Uh, I, I don't, he wanted I don't to spray know. chemicals I mean, in the air to, to block the sun. Yes, he did want to do that. He wanted to really do chemtrails. And uh, it, it, I, I, I've, I've never liked the way he is. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he's a moral person to begin with. But uh, he's also scientifically illiterate. Yeah. And maybe he's, I don't know, maybe he's trying to make himself look like a good guy. But I don't see how that would make him look like a good guy amongst his peers, because they're all all the David Davos crowd and the IPCC crowd. You know, the, the second largest assemblage of private jets in the world is at Davos, at the World Economic Forum. And the largest assemblage of private jets is at the Climate Change Conference. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Well, it's like the, uh, the, the carbon credit scam, I'll call it a scam, where you have um, political elites that have given themselves the right that they'll allow you to sin by producing carbon above the, the levels they claim is safe, like China is a big violator, as long as you pay them carbon credits. This is like the Pope back in the 1400s selling indulgences for sin. Yep. You can sin as long as you pay us, and they don't have to produce anything. No. Like that I can understand the profit motive for that one. <laughs> so that makes sense to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid we are in uh, interesting times as the Chinese proverb goes. May you live in interesting times. Uh, it, it's beyond me. I've studied all my life. I think I understand the basics of biology and physics and a few other things and the history of the earth. But I can't for the life of me understand the politics of today. And it, it's, it, is, it is completely insane, and especially in the West, we are destroying our own institutions, holus bolus, and, and believing in all these ridiculous things about the world practically coming to an end, when the only thing that'll come to an end is the human species if we don't smarten up here. But I, it's, it's like as if there's a complete disconnect between people who understand what's going on versus the decision makers that are creating what's going on. And you take the Manhattan Institute, for example, there's a, 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 an expert there, I'm trying to remember his name now, but he's just so brilliant. And he understands this thing perfectly. He figured out it was gonna cost the GDP of the whole world to do the wind solar battery thing, right? In other words, there wouldn't be any leftover for food or clothes or anything because it would take the whole GDP. And, and hopefully more people will wake up to that, but some people seem to always manage to, to figure out how to benefit from suffering. Other people's suffering. Yes. I, it's the strangest thing, but it seems to work sometimes. You know, I always say it's a good thing that half the people aren't evil, because there wouldn't be any people. So thankfully, it's only about four or five percent or something, you know, that are actually evil. But they, they do a lot of damage. And so I, that's where I was talking to Neil about how they, they, the Greenpeace says that humans are inherently evil and anti-nature and all that stuff, like as if all of us are responsible for being evil. It's not true. Almost everybody tries to figure out how to leave a good, lead a good life and not harm others and all those good things. But there's a few people who don't care about that too much and some of them rise to be multi-billionaires and say things like, you will own nothing and be happy. Yeah. You know, well, who's gonna own it then? You are, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and they like to talk about reducing the human population down to 500 million. Right? Bill Gates will say that. It comes out of the, it's one of the repetitive themes. They say that the carrying capacity of Earth is about 500 million. Yeah, right. Well, then how do you go from 8 billion to 500 million? Maybe by doing this stuff, right? I don't know. I mean, they're telling us. Thanks. 
So this will be my final question for the evening. What would you leave, I mean, we're not millionaires and billionaires, movers and shakers in this room. But I think we'd all, we all, one thing we all agree on is moving forward, this is going to have to be a grassroots movement. The revolution is going to have to be a grassroots movement. What can the average Joe and Jane do starting this week to fight this, to make a change, and to push things in a positive direction? Well, I don't know how optimistic I am uh, given the I, I, I've always wondered whether or not our brains at a collective level were going to be able to cope with the electronic media and the uh, total barrage of information from all over the place trying to sort it out. Um, it's possible that we can't and that we have to go through something to come out the other side. Um, I don't see a game plan now to stop these people from the idiocy that they are practicing. Although when, when I'm, I'm in with my CO2 coalition back in, 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 in D.C., well, we're just outside in Arlington, Virginia, um, such good people, who, who, almost all of whom are retired because they wouldn't be able to join the CO2 coalition if they were still employed by somebody because they'd be fired. And uh, so th there's a fair bit of gray hair in there. But John Clauser, for example, just joined us. And he is a 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics. And he uh, got his Nobel Prize because he mediated a dispute between Einstein and Niels Bohr, who was a famous physicist back then. And Klaus determined that Niels Bohr was correct. And this was accepted because he explained it in such a way that the other physicists said, yeah, you're right. Einstein was wrong on that one. So that's the kind of people we're working with. But I find that, that scientists, and, and I count myself as one, not really wanting to get into the muck of politics, <coughs> certainly not personally. Um, most of them are just not willing to get involved in the crap. You know, they want to stick to their knitting and he's, he's proven this thing. It's the most interesting thing. There are such things as particles in physics. Um, they just call them particles for some. But he, he, he proved that Niels Bohr was right in saying that once two particles touch each other or come into interaction with each other, that mark continues to be there even if they're a trillion light years apart. It doesn't, that, it doesn't go away. And I, I, for the life of him, I can't explain it properly, but uh, that's, that's what it was about, something like that. And it's so refreshing to uh, be with people. Our coalition only has, even now, about 200 and some odd members because everybody who joins us has to be accepted by all 10 of the directors after reading their resumes and meeting them and everything. We're very picky about who we take in because there's lots of organizations that have been bas basically hijacked by membership becoming different than the original idea. And uh, we don't want that to happen. And we are gaining power in the political sphere now. Uh, we have good writers. We have an education program that is producing a, a, a series of comic books for grade school kids that explain all this stuff. And uh, we're we're all, many of us are writing op-eds and articles. For example, the most recent op-ed I wrote was for the Epic Times in the States. It was reprinted in Canada about the whales and the windmills off the East Coast with the top guy in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, political guy, is saying there's no, no problem. Meanwhile, 
his person in charge of threatened species in, the, in his own organization writes a 20-page memorandum and sends it all around to the people that would want to read it saying this is a definitely a danger to these species because it's their main feeding grounds. About 4,000 humpback whales, they all go down to the Dominican Republic to give birth to their young, which Eileen and I did in a snorkeling expedition about eight years ago. We went down there in a boat that had about 30 guests. There's two boats that are allowed to go there. It's north of D Dominican Republic, about 70 miles, and it's a huge coral reef that no shipping goes over because it's dangerous. So it's, you're all by yourself out there. And the, the whales come to this shallow place to give birth. And so the, the young uh, humpback whales, the, the mother dives down and the young humpback whale comes and gets under the mother's chin. Because they float they're, when they're young so that they won't drown. The adults can adjust their, can, their, their uh, buoyancy so they can be wherever they want in the water column. So the mother goes down, and the baby comes under, and the mother just rests there while the baby goes in five-minute cycles to breathe. But the mother doesn't have to breathe except every half hour or more. So we watch that from the surface in 20, 20 30 feet of water. And then there's the, the, the males, uh, the bachelor males and the male groups. And they're, they got nothing to do until the moms have finished nursing, and then they have their mating because they have a, almost exactly one year gestation period. And then they go back up when the summer comes and all the fish bloom off the east coast of the U.S. from, from Cape Cod all the way down to Florida. Those, those whales are feeding all through there and fattening themselves up to have another baby. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. Everybody should see that too. And, and it's not cheap, but it's worth it. So what, how does the windmill impact the, uh, the seismic is the first thing. They do se seismic bangs onto the seafloor to see where the, what, the, what the strata is there because they're going to be putting these great big pylons in there. Um, but then the, 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 that ends up with way more boat traffic and uh, hitting whales with a boat is a big problem if there's a lot of boats. Um, but the, 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 the number of whales washing ashore since they began this program has gone up by 400%. And most whales don't wash ashore, most of them sink. Everybody knows the, about the right whale. The Atlantic right whale, there's only 300 of them left, or four at the most. And they're in this same area. You know why they're called a the right whale? Because they don't sink when you kill them. And so the sailing ships were focused on them because the sperm whale and many other whales sink to the bottom as soon as they die. And so you, they have to put a big harpoon in them with a gas and blow them up. And then they stick a flag on them and go kill another one until they got 10 or 12 to pick up. And uh, we've seen that all over our times out there. We were there for months at a time. And uh, so I wrote an a op-ed that got really spread around. and. It, Looks like they're going to have trouble with this because now all the wind companies are coming back to Biden's people and saying we need double the money we said in the first place because everything's gone up and, uh, and the, the, the money isn't there, I don't think. So we may be lucky not to. It's, it's hundreds of wind turbines and big, great big ones. And it does make it a different environment altogether when you do that. So I hope they don't get to do that. You know, the, it was Obama who passed the legislation in an executive order to exempt all the wind turbines from killing birds, including the big raptors, which are, you know, the hawks and eagles and owls, but also the bats at night. Millions of bats are being killed by the wind turbines and they're exempt from any punishment. When 500 ducks died in the oil sands, the, you know, the whole world went into a conniption fit. And, and there's 10 million ducks in Alberta alone. But the windmills have got an exemption from it. And the fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, has a bird morgue 
where they collect all the dead big birds and put them in a plastic, one in a plastic bag and hang them from the ceiling. There's pictures of it on the internet. I don't know why they're doing it or what they think they're going to do with a bunch of dead birds, but there is a bird morgue and it's full of dead birds from windmill strikes. Well, so you, you, would, you call yourself not an optimist, but it's funny because my, the net effect of your education systems, your speeches and stuff makes me optimistic. I don't know if I'm the only one in here. You have an optimism that seems to flow from you naturally. And in any movement, we need the brain trust like Dr. Moore to educate and mobilize and motivate us. Uh, one of the branches of We Unify is what's called the accountability groups. And they actually show up in regional uh, council meetings where no one's paying attention, no one cares. They're sometimes the only people who show up. And we've had members go there and actually get reactions, positive responses on environmental issues simply by showing up and educating these counselors. Yeah. And it, there's been no revolutionary movement in history that hasn't come from a minority, okay? We're talking massive changes throughout history have come from a mobilized minor minority. About 3% of Americans fought King George in the Revolutionary War. Yeah, all movements start small. Yes. That's why I think Maxine is doing a good thing. Correct. I don't even care if he ever gets elected. <laughs> He's my buddy. He came to, uh, to Alberta to a conference that uh, Danny Hozak puts on every year on with a lot of climate discussion and fossil fuel discussion. And, Maxime piped up, he says, you know, I'm proud to be an Albertan from Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> so I call myself an Albertan from BC when I go over there. Because I do get a lot of invitations to Alberta. I've never worked for the oil industry. Everybody says I work for the oil industry, in, you know, in the, on the Twitter and stuff. I have never worked for them. They can work, they're, they're all, they don't need me. But and if, as a matter of fact, Sometimes I, I, I don't understand uh, why they are going along with all of this stuff. They're going along with carbon capture. They're, going, they're all trying to be goody two-shoes about it when they should be fighting like a trench soldier. Yeah. You know, it it's just uh, drives me nuts. I don't want really to work for them because they're not working for themselves. You know, they're all pretending that they're on the bandwagon with this. BP. I think BP was just warned by one of its major funders to get off that kick because they're, you know, they're investing in wind and solar and all that stuff and yeah, they're shooting themselves in the foot, which is not an uncommon practice for the human being. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go and find my wife at, at the well, red line. I think I speak for all of us, and I want us to give you a round warm of applause, round of applause, Dr. Moore. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.